Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for the Black Alumni of MIT Research Slam. I'm Holly Carter, uh, PhD 77, Course 17, and President of BAMIT. And I'm delighted to welcome you here today to spotlight some of the up and coming best and brightest black researchers uh, from MIT. I'm joined this afternoon by our judges, Aidan Allen, who's class of 02 and a senior associate at Wilson, Sonsini, Goodridge and Rosati law firm. Um, uh, he has a focus on intellectual property and technology litigation. Valencia Kumsum, class of 98 and 99, uh, associate professor at Tufts University and visiting MLK professor at MIT this year. And Kendra Pierre-Louis, a 2016 master's alum and senior reporter for Gimlet Media. Judges, could you warm us up just a little bit by telling us where you're calling from and what your past year has been like and maybe what you're looking forward to this afternoon? Start with at Aiden. Looks like you're on mute, Aiden. Can you, uh, can you yeah, unmute uh, Aiden? All right, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for... Uh, uh, invited me to be a judge. I'm calling from Austin, Texas, as you see in the background, uh, if you're familiar with that. Uh, the last year has been interesting. Um, you know, I have two young boys, uh, both under seven. So being in quarantine has been quite um, a challenge, um, but hopefully with the vaccines rolling out and everything, um, things will get better soon. So uh, right. welcome and I'm looking forward to this, thanks. Thank you so much, Valencia. Good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to, to be here today, uh, see all of you. I am, um, this year has been, it's been a great year. Um, it's been great to be back virtually, even virtually on campus, but to, to, um, to start the MLK Fellowship um, has really been a wonderful experience so far. And I have until the end of the year um, at MIT. And, uh, and it's just been, been great to kind of re-engage with um, um, old colleagues and, and former instructors and to see the campus from a different lens. Great, thank you. And Kendra. Hi, um, I guess uh, I'm, I'm zooming in from New England. I'm kind of a little bit coy as to where, because it's a small town uh, where I ran away in the middle of the pandemic because I normally live in New York City. Um, past year has been weird apart from just like moving, I also switched jobs in the middle of the pandemic. So I now have been working with my coworkers for almost a year, most of whom I've never met in real life, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to move back home and to meet my coworkers, I guess, <laughs> in the coming year. Right, okay, well, thank you. Thank you all very much. And we're just so, so pleased to have you um, as judges um, this afternoon, thank you. Um, now let's get to the main event here. Um, in the next hour, we'll hear from seven researchers. We'll ask them all to come on video um, and you can see them now. Um, I'm just gonna quickly introduce, uh, introduce them and, um, and then we'll move forward. Uh, we start with um, Angie Okono, uh, who is class of 11 and PhD 13. Um, and she's at Northwestern University as an assistant professor. And then we have Rod Bayless, who's class of 20, and then um, class of 21, master's, um, and he's from Cal Berkeley. We have Samuel Denard, class of 74, who's at Texas Tech. Um, Elise Myers, uh, class of 14, um, with a combined MS, and also in 14, who's coming to us from Columbia. Um, Danielle Olson, who's class of 14, um, master's 19, uh, and um, 20, 21 also, right, Danielle? I think, 
um, and she's from MIT. Uh, and then Keith uh, Pudi, uh, who is class of 19 from Carnegie Mellon. And finally, uh, Toya Punjol Mitchell, who is um, class of 707 from Purdue, also an assistant professor. We'll post a list of all the competitors and their affiliations in the chat for the audience to see. It's there now. Um, but here are the rules they're going to abide by this afternoon. Um, we're going to ask each of them to present their research in about four minutes or less. Um, they've all been limited to one slide, and so you'll see some very full slides, but that's, that's wonderful. And we'll ring a subtle bell when time is up. And 10 seconds later, um, we may make a less subtle sound um, so that we have every, a chance for everyone not only to present, but also um, for the audience and judges to make their comments as well. The judges will evaluate research pitches, um, not the research itself, using the following criteria. Did the competitor make effective use of time? explain the topic in terms understandable to everyone, speak clearly and speak in an appropriate pace, capture your attention from the beginning of the presentation and hold it, motivate or advance or propose viable options to the problem, question or goal that they're, they're focused on, convince you of the importance of their research and create an effective visual that supports the pitch. After each pitch is completed, we will field one question from the audience. But, please, uh, uh, but prior to that, we may have some, a comment from the judges. Please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar, toolbar for questions and while the judges are tallying their scores. After that, the judges will weigh in on each competitor. Finally, audience participants are invited to stick around after the event to ask additional questions of our competitors. Our competitors will not only take home glory, publicity, and some good tips on communicating their science, but there's also cash prizes at stake today, a total of $1,750 uh, that will be awarded um, to our first, second, and third place. Now for our first presenter, Keith Kluge from Carnegie Mellon. Okay, hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, um, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Keith Kuti. I'm a class of 2019, graduated in the physics department, and I'm currently a second year PhD at Carnegie Mellon University in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And I'm going to talk to you today about our approach to room temperature superconductivity using electrochemistry and pressure. So just to set the stage, uh, what are superconducting materials? Well, superconducting materials are materials that allow current to flow through without any loss of energy. So they're super efficient at letting uh, electricity pass through. Uh, if you consider, for example, the amount of energy that's lost in getting electricity from the plant to your home about, is about 6% of that energy is wasted just in making that electricity pass through wires. And there's a whole lot of applications for superconducting materials ranging from quantum computing, fusion energy, all the buzzwords. And the thing that's really limiting these technologies is that we don't really have any good superconducting materials. Why aren't they good? Well, that's because they're limited by something known as a like low critical temperature. That essentially means they only work at very low temperatures, typically on the order of about 70 Kelvin, hundreds of degrees below room temperature. Uh, for instance, if you, if you consider a quantum computer, right, this is your typical picture of what a quantum computer looks like, but essentially this isn't a quantum computer. This is all the things used to cool it down, and that uses a lot of energy and wastes a lot of energy in the process. So typical superconductors today live in this space where they, they only work at very low temperatures, but a new class of superconductors have been discovered, which are known as superhydride superconductors. These are materials that contain lots of hydrogen, and they can work at room temperature. But the problem is they only work at extreme pressures, the kinds of pressures that only diamond can withstand, which is a really, which makes them impractical for use in any real application. 
But this is not the first time people have looked at superhydrides. There's, in parallel, people in the engineering world have always wanted to use materials with lots of hydrogen, particularly for hydrogen storage, for things like hydrogen fuel cells and hydrogen cars. And the way they make these materials is using electrochemistry. So they apply a voltage across the material and allow the hydrogen to flow in so that it can be stored within that material. Um, but there are limitations to that. And you see that these are two parallel paths, two worlds that have never really come in contact, but they're all trying to achieve the same thing. They're all trying to make superhydrides. So our approach is thinking, okay, look at these two worlds. They're both trying to achieve the same thing. What if we combine their methods and using both their methods of, of electrochemistry and to apply pressure, can we use this combination to synthesize new pathways to make these superconducting materials? And the ideal goal is to find the sweet spot where we have superconductors that work at room temperature as well as at reasonable pressures. And this could all potentially change the game in terms of how we think about designing new devices and uh, how different systems work and saving energy. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, are there any uh, questions or comments from the judges? I have one question. Great presentation. Um, the superhydrides, uh, can you comment a little bit about uh, the manufacturing challenges and how you actually manufacture these types of materials? Yeah. Can they be manufactured using um, you know, standard microfabrication processes, some of the lithography and etching or? Uh, not really, these are very, they're sort of at the extremes of what experiments can do. For instance, the superhydrides that have been shown to have superconductivity can only be done in what's called the diamond anvil cell, where you apply hundreds of gigapascals of pressure and you have to use diamond because that's the only material that can withstand that sort of pressure. Mm -hmm. Then on the other hand, when you're trying to make a superhydride with electrochemistry, you're trying, the limitation is this, what's known as the hydrogen evolution reaction, essentially. The, the hydrogen would rather bubble away and, and leave as gas than go into the material. And the thing is that pressure actually solves the problem of the hydrogen bubbling away. So these two things together are likely to be much better than the, the, the sum of some of the two things. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask the audience if you could please use your Q and A um, on the toolbar to ask your questions. That would be helpful. Um, th there's one in Q&A now. Um, Keith, they're saying this is fascinating. Um, what's your tech commercialization plan? Uh, what are the hurdles? And what's the expected timeline? <laughs> well, uh, first, we, I guess we, we'd have to get to the proof of concept stage. Right now, we're at sort of a fundam understanding the fundamental aspects of, 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 of this application in terms of, is it possible to combine these two in a reasonable way? And we're going to be doing experiments in the next few years to sort of test this out. And we do believe that we will get something. We'll get either something that has a lot, very good, is very good at storing hydrogen or something that's super connecting within the next few years. So at least we're still at the proof of concept stage. Uh, the tech commercialization might come <laughs> afterwards if, if the first few stages are successful. Okay. All right, you've generated a lot of questions here. We've got another one. Uh, what's the first end application? Um, the first end application would, tip would be probably for small devices. So it, wires are very far and, and, and in the future and sort of are a tougher engineering problem. But there's a lot of thinking around how do we use superconductors and for instance, quantum computing. They, they, uh, people in quantum computing want to use these to make the, the chips that they use. And what if these can operate at higher temperatures, that would be save a lot of energy and make computers much larger than, than they are today. Essentially the same principle of going from a, a computer fitting an entire room to being in a, in a box essentially would be a dream. Okay, uh, I'm gonna take one more question here now. Um, how does high atmospheric attitudinal differences impact the conducting properties of the superconducting materials in different ways than on Earth? Um, so uh, in terms of scale, the, the difference in pressures corresponding to altitude are, are very tiny compared to the pressures that you'd have. For instance, the difference in pressure from low altitude to high altitude is a couple of bars. So maybe one bar at room at, at uh, surface at sea level 
to maybe 10 bar, to maybe to lower bar, maybe 0 0.1 or 0 0.01 at you know one kilometer in the sky. So those differences are very small compared to the scale that you need to actually make these materials. So you need a thousand times more pressure to actually make an interesting material. So altitude really doesn't play a significant factor. Great, great. Okay, thank you. We've got a couple more questions here, but but uh, I'm hoping that those people who are posing the questions will stay around because you've got uh, plenty of opportunity after everyone has um, done their presentation to follow up with some questions to the individual competitors. Um, so um, with, with that, um, we can uh, move on to our third competitor, um, Samuel Denard uh, from Texas Tech. Sam. This is my dissertation research, um, um, which was performed at uh, Texas Tech University. Uh, I graduated in May, as a matter of fact. Um, people who manage and develop products have a problem. There are few, if any, objective methods for calculating whether a development project will succeed. The problem's pain points are driving my research to answer two questions. Can a development cycle be meaningfully, that is to say, quantitatively modeled? And can the risks associated with a development cycle be quantitatively modeled? The statistical agent-based model of development and evaluation Saab MD is an answer to both questions. The model is an end-to-end, domain-independent, quantitative model of development cycles. The model is based on the simple idea that development agents uh, use tools to compose products from parts. The products are sequentially composed based on the agent's decisions. At each decision point, an agent has a choice of parts and tools with which to make a, a next composition. The hierarchy of possible decisions forms a development space, which we call a D space. The sequence of decisions forms a development path, a D path, through that space. The correct D path leads to a desired end product. The slide's uh, leftmost column illustrates these ideas for a simple development project, a Lego portrait, which is composed of, of a bunch of Legos sequentially placed. Just like an algebraic system or a data structure in a computer program, a D space has characteristics and properties. Those properties include price of a part, an agent's probability of making a correct composition decision, the Shannon information in a D path and so on. The properties allow the model to extract useful results from the D space. For example, uh, the model can estimate the cost of a project. For software projects, the model compares quite well to the Kokomo model that has been the gold standard for such things for, for decades. You can see the comparison at the top of the center of the slide. Also, the model can guide an agent's decision-making to the degree that the agent understands their development goal. The agent contributes that understanding to the model as a series of tests. The test results redistribute the information in the D space such that the better paths to end products have less information than others. The better the tests, the greater the distinction among the paths. The graph at the bottom of the table uh, and the table on the right are examples of, of that principle having been applied. By the same token, a lesser distinction among paths is a signal that an agent does not have sufficient understanding to make a decision. In this way, the model makes it possible to know that there is a problem before resources are expended. The model is acting basically as a measure of decision quality. Well, um, there's a lot more to the model than what I've just discussed, but this is a four minute overview. Um, the research continues, uh, implementation is, is in progress, and I would enjoy speaking with any of you who have uh, an interest in the topic. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you, Sam. Um, questions or comments from our judges? Can you, um, great presentation. Uh, can you comment on some of the limits of the model? Um, is it limited by um, the amount of the information content or the number of users, uh, the number of work? Can you can just comment maybe on some of the complexities of um, limit and limitations. Well, it's interesting that you use the word complexity because that is actually one of the one of the things that the model can produce. Uh, there, there are limitations in a variety of ways. There, are, of course, the research is not complete, and there are edges to my understanding of the model. Uh, there are computational limitations. Um, for example, um, there are a variety of statistical functions that have to get computed, and as um, the numbers get large. You see here in this example, uh, the, there are two kinds of Legos, black and white, and one method for putting them together, a, a total of three parts and tools, but a, a real project might have thousands of such things. And um, as those combinations grow, uh, it places computational constraints on compilers, on uh, the numerical um, uh, components of, of, of compilers and so on, and just on, on the math itself. So I have a, a, a couple of workarounds for that kind of thing. Um, there's a more interesting kind of constraint uh, that was revealed by this model, actually, to me anyway. I'm sure you've all seen a, 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 the trick of the eye, the optical illusion, uh, where just like the, the picture you see here, there appear to be either a vase or two people looking at each other. Well, in, in, in such a case, the model structurally cannot distinguish between the two, even though people can. Um, right now, I'm calling that an, a, an intellectual kind of aliasing. Um, that is a, a, one of the things at the limit of the model's capability at the moment. So in answer to your question, yes, there are a number of limitations in a number of dimensions. Um, we've got uh, one question, and I uh, again I see uh, a couple of questions here, and um, I was a bit remiss in the last one. We're going to take one question from the audience, but note that um, our researchers uh, can answer your questions either in the Q and A or in chat if we don't get to them um, live. So uh, the question, the first question that I have in Q and A is. Are any one or several of the properties in the D space dominant or significantly controlling and impacting the evaluation, the evaluative outcome? An interesting question, and it has a variety of answers, actually. Um, the E at the end of the model's name evaluation has to do with the tests that an agent produces in order to add understanding and therefore reduce information within the model. Um, the, those tests are generated by the agent. And to the degree that the agent can create good tests, uh, then the model works well. Uh, so that's kind of a, 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 a actually the, the major impact that the agent has on the model and on the model's performance. The flip side of that, however, is that the model provides some numerical feedback to the agent about whether their tests, the understanding they are adding, is of some quality. And that's missing these days. Right now, people can, can start working on projects and make all kinds of decisions, and they really have no measure of whether they're doing it well uh, or, and, and they may not discover that until far down the line when things don't work properly. Does that address your question? Um, I think it probably did for the person who, who asked it, but thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we are going to move on now to our fourth presenter, um, Roderick Bayless uh, from Cal Berkeley. Alrighty, hello. Let me 
one second. Cool. Today, I'm going to talk about planes, not just any planes, electric aircraft, really the next generation of how humans get around the world. Planes were a gigantic technological revolution when they came out, but as we all know, the climate is warming. We need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and transportation is a very large sector of the United States and humanities in general, uh, greenhouse gas emissions on the order of 30% of total uh, GHG emissions. One big opportunity for reducing these emissions is through electric aircraft. Jet fuel is expensive, planes go fast, they burn a lot of fuel. And if we could stop producing these really toxic you know, fumes, it would be really great. Um, however, this is a very, very non-trivial problem. Uh, getting humans off the ground and flying was really hard and developing jet engines additionally was really hard. But in my opinion, this is another level of difficulty. Now I'm a bit biased because I think the research I'm doing is hard and worth doing, um, but it's a hard problem. Namely, the new electric propulsion techniques that we need to go towards have to be really light and power dense. As I said before, planes consume a lot of power. It takes a lot of oomph to get your plane up and going. And trying to replace a gas turbine, which God made super easy to just explode and spin and produce thrust into an electric engine is really difficult. Uh, and namely, we need to think about new technologies for motors to uh, re increase that power density. One really promising uh, way to get that higher power density is to remove the steel from our motors. Steel is heavy, but it's really good magnetically, um, and it makes it easy to drive the motor. Uh, now, I do power electronics, which is, in, which is in the business of moving energy around from your battery to your motor. Uh, and if someone tells me, hello, this motor is harder to drive, but it's lighter, that doesn't make me super happy. It makes my job a good bit harder. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we solve this problem of these new power dense motors for electric aircraft. On the bottom left, I have um, two schematics shown here. The, uh, I guess you could say, st industry standard way of solving this problem is using a quote unquote three level inverter. By turning these switches on and off in a smart manner, you switch between this zero point here, this, let's call it positive one point here, and negative one point here. By doing that and controlling the pulses of those switches, you can re recreate a sine wave. You can imagine if you average this signal, you probably get the black waveform here. However, this is a bit crude. Uh, you, I'm switching all the way up and then all the way down. And if I wanna get some voltage in between there, it's not gonna be super nice. So I need really big filter elements. Those filters are big, expensive and heavy and not super great. I can instead go to a seven level topology called a seven level FCML here and switch between multiple different levels by using these capacitors here. By doing this, I get a more faithful sinusoid and I can drive these light motors. Additionally, by being a really smart about how I design this converter, I can make my power electronics at really small and light in addition to my small and light motor. So I get this light motor that needs good sinusoids and I have my inverter, which gives it good sinusoids and is also light. And it allows me to go to the electric aircraft space. I've shown on the top right here, our prototype circuit that actually does this and works extraordinarily well. Uh, you can see the uh, text overlays that correspond uh, each of the components to the you know, generic circuit schematic. Uh, but I'll point out two main things. One, this device is really planar. It's flat, it's great, it's really easy to cool. If I'm producing a lot of heat and I can just put a slab of metal on it and take heat out, that's amazing. And that's one thing that's really enabled by this design. Additionally, we're using a new type of transistor, a gallium nitride transistor, which is small, fast, easy to cool, and just great. Uh, additionally, we operate on a card system so we can parallel a lot of these modules to drive a gigantic plane if the need be. I think I'm at time, uh, but I do want to comment on the table where we are hitting and exceeding a lot of the NASA performance specs for this project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions or comments from uh, any of our judges? Uh, I have one question. Great presentation. Um, for, your, for your seven level FCML design, when you compute peak efficiency, do you include the amount of power consumed in controlling all the, this complex set of switches as well? Yes, exactly. So uh, I titled the slide additional complexity because it is inherently more complex with more switches, more capacitors, more control required. Uh, but with the advent of better, more efficient computation, better, more efficient gate drive techniques that our group has really been pioneering in the last few years, 
this that efficiency spec does include all of those, uh, we call them switching losses or gate driving losses. Um, and so that's included in this peak efficiency. If you don't include it, I think you go above that like 0.05% to get to the 99% plus, uh, but compared to the total 20 something kilowatts that each of these cards is processing, mm -hmm. it's a minor fraction of the total power loss. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Let me see, we have a couple of questions here. Um, uh, question, um, let's see. Is the proposed alternative to propulsion systems applicable to other types of engines or propulsion systems in use today, even yes. with modifications? Yeah, 100%. Um, so electric vehicles are something I didn't really talk about. I mostly talked about planes, but this works great for an electric vehicle as well. They have the exact same type of problem. I have this car that needs to move people. I want to consume as little energy as possible because batteries are heavy. Um, and also, if I'm processing a lot of power, let's say I want to pull 80 miles an hour on the freeway, that's a lot of power um, and pl places significant thermal stress on your system. Through this approach, you accomplish both the ease in pulling heat out of your components and reducing the overall component size. Additionally, you could imagine the same benefits that we get from removing the steel from the, our aircraft motors could also go to these traction drives within our electric vehicles, thereby uh, cleaning up the supply chain, reducing costs, reducing mass, increasing efficiency, and getting more miles out of your car, which it still is a somewhat gator uh, for the adoption of electric vehicles today. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, we are gonna take, um, about a five minute, uh, actually I'm gonna break that down a little more, about a, a three minute break um, so that our judges have a chance to uh, reconnect <laughs> and uh, do what they need to do. Um, we've heard wonderful research from Danielle, Keith, Sam, and Rod, and uh, look forward to the remaining three competitors that we have. Um, I want to just remind um, our audience um, as much as possible to use the Q&A. We may not get to all of the questions, but um, when all of the presenters have finished and while the judges are doing their tabulations, um, we should have time for you to um, continue to pose your questions either at that point in the chat or in Q&A uh, to the individual uh, competitors. Um, and um, I'm sure they will um, both appreciate uh, the comments and questions that you have um, as it allows them to fine tune uh, what they're doing. Um, the other thing, I, um, I, as president of BAMIT, <laughs> I'm gonna take this opportunity also to just generally say we are so pleased to have you all here. Um, our judges are just wonderful in giving their time. And for us to highlight um, this extraordinary uh, research that's going on uh, with black scientists who have their origins here and are alumni of MIT uh, and therefore part of our membership um, is, is a wonderful for us. So we are grateful to everyone who's participating and for our audience today as well. Thank you so very much uh, for being a part of this. One of the other things that I will do during this break while the judges are doing their thing here, uh, for those of you in the audience who may have um, come in a little late, I just wanna go over the rules again. Um, that we are using for our competitors. Um, um, as you've heard, uh, they're uh, limited to about four minutes uh, to make their presentations. And that's difficult because we're asking them to, to, to collapse down um, both uh, an extraordinary amount of work and the passion associated with that work uh, to four minutes. But so far they've all done a wonderful job in doing that. Um, they're limited to one slide, um, and um, that's uh, one so that, you know, we can have some um, uh, equity in terms of um, how they're presenting. And what's most important here um, is indeed 
not the research necessarily, but their ability to pitch their research, to um, make sure that as they talk about their research, they've done so in a way that um, everyone can not only understand, but really key into. Um, and I think we've had wonderful examples of that so far um, in the uh, presentations that we've had to date. So um, for, for uh, Danielle and Keith and Sam and Rod, thank you for being wonderful examples of uh, what we're trying to do here today. I'm going to check in with our, our judges. Are you ready to go? Can we, can we continue? I guess I'm not yes, hearing any I'm nay. Ready. Yes. I'm not hearing any nay. So I'm going to, I'm going to pick up again because I want to make sure that we have time uh, for our remaining three. Um, our next competitor is Angie Okono. Uh, and she is from Northwestern uh, University. So Angie, um, we'll ask you to. Uh... Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hi. Okay, so today I'm gonna be talking, thank you for having me. So today I'm gonna be talking about how can you make cement smarter and tougher. So my research motivation is really looking at the world population that is increasing exponentially. And most of this population is going to be concentrated in cities in the future. And the estimates is that two out of three people will be living in cities by 2050. Now, when you think about a city, we want to create optimal quality of life. And this is why we're thinking of smart cities. And there are three different criteria. So one of them is going to be energy consumption. Another one is going to be connectivity because we all like to be connected to our friends and family. And finally, we want to be able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions just to be able to mitigate climate change, but also to reduce pollution levels. So in order to be able to achieve that vision of smart cities, we need to be able to have smart infrastructure materials. We need to discover smart infrastructure materials. So we, when we think about smart, this time we have three more metrics specific to materials. One of them is to reduce the carbon footprint from the synthesis throughout the lifetime of the structure and all the way to the recycling of the material. Then we're also gonna think about optimizing the mechanical resistance. And in my lab, we really focus on resistance to fracture propagation. Then finally, we also want to increase the multifunctional be behavior, for instance, increase the electrical conductivity. So in my lab, the driving hypothesis is that we can achieve those objectives by incorporating carbon-based nanomaterial, such as multi-wall carbon nanotube within Portland cement matrices. And that this way now we're focusing on understanding what would be the suitable synthesis or what would be the key steps so for instance, one step is how do you disperse those, nano, those nanomaterials within cement matrices and how do you mix and cure them? We are also trying to understand what is the fundamental influence of multi-wall carbon nanotubes and other type of nanomaterials on the microstructure and on the performance of cement. So to be able to do it, we have a highly interdisciplinary approach where we do a lot of nanoscale mechanical testing probing the answer of the material, the mechanical response directly at the nanometer land scale and below. And we use electron microscopy to observe the microstructure and observe the different failure modes. We usually have a large amount of data points in the millions. This is why we need to use advanced machine learning method to be able to identify underlying principles. So we made two findings last year. The first one is that nanomaterial are really going to reinforce the material directly at the, the nanometer and molecular level. So I'm showing you a graphene nanoplatelet that are connecting cement hydro hydration products at the nanometer land scale. As a result of that, nanomaterial are affecting the makeup of cement directly, um, directly at the molecular level, even changing the DNA. So what they can do, they can reinforce and increase the mechanical properties they can increase the resistance to cracking, but they can also increase the resistance in this case, we're thinking to the durability or resistance, for instance, to water. So to be able to summarize uh, what we've done, what we've done is to discover novel synthesis routes 
we explore a lot the space in terms of how do we disperse nanomaterial, how do we mix them, what are the optimal curing conditions, but also understand the influence of the nanomaterial on the DNA of cement, creating what we call gene editing. So if we can change the elemental, the distribution of elementary building blocks, then we know that we can improve the mechanical resistance down at the molecular level. And in the next step, we want to be able to look at the long-term performance. So for instance, how can we predict the behavior of structures with cement, with, with uh, carbon-based nanomaterial within 10 years, 20 years, or even 50 years? Thank you very much. Thank you, Angie. Um, we have one question here. Um, I'll take that, and then I'll go to our judges. Um, has your research incorporated consideration of the environmental impact of the different type of cement, especially the impact of, on the increased or decreased contributions to the carbon footprint that would result in, in the overall environment? That's a very good question. So we really pay attention a lot to the carbon footprint. And that is because the cement industry as a whole represent 8% of greenhouse gas emission. So what we show, we're showing is that by increasing, uh, by adding just small level of nanomaterial, we can increase the performance so that we are reducing the volume. Because one of the issues currently with, vol with cement is that a large volume is needed to be able to boost the growing urbanization. However, if you are able to increase the performance, then we can reduce the volume and that way affect directly the carbon footprint. Great, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Um, comment or questions from any of our judges? I, I just thank you for the presentation. I thought it was really insightful and got to the point real quick on why this was needed. Oh, that's a really good point. We need that to be able to, to promote smart cities in this case. So the world population is increasing and people are really living concentrated in cities. So when you think in cities, you have aging infrastructure, but you also need to design new buildings and you want to create optimal living conditions in terms of reducing CO2 emission, for instance, and promoting higher connectivity. This is why we need to focus on the material themselves to be able to enable that vision. Hmm. Great, thank you. Okay, did I, um, Valencia, did I see you ask, ask, getting ready to ask a question or? Yes, I just want, if it's, if, it, if there's time for, yeah, time there for is. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Great presentation, Ajay. Wonderful to see you again. Um, I was wondering the graph you showed at the lower left side. What was the concentration of your the carbon nanomaterial in that um, in the results that you displayed? That's a very good point. So in this result, we have zero point five weight percent. So we really have small volume fraction that we are increasing. That's and what we are what we're looking for what is can we go from zero point five weight percent to two percent primarily to be able to increase the multifunctional behavior but it's still really low fraction to be able to increase also as well, the mechanical resistance and keep down the carbon footprint. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Our next presenter is Elise Myers uh, from Columbia University. Elise, take it away. All right, um, can you see the slide all right? We can, thank, thank yes. you. Um, so first, before I started, I did want to say thank you so much um, for coordinating the event. Um, this is really wonderful, just learning about what everyone else is doing. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, all right, so now I will jump right into it. So before you go outside, especially after four years of living in Cambridge, you likely are going to check the forecast to find out what you should take with you to prepare yourself. But what if you wanted to go out on the water, sailing, swimming, jet skiing? It would be helpful to know what the projected water quality is. Urban waters like the Hudson River estuary where I work are regularly subjected to discharges of untreated or partially treated sewage, oftentimes when infrastructure is overwhelmed during rainfall events. In New York City and Albany, water from our toilets, our showers, sinks, and all stormwater flow into the same combined systems. From these cities, only a quarter of an inch of rain causes these discharges of untreated diluted sewage. But how long will that sewage pollution last? And how long should you avoid water recreation so that an accidental mouthful won't get you sick? The most common method to test for sewage contamination is to take a water sample today, grow the bacteria, and then tomorrow one could judge if it was safe to swim. 
the day before. So this 24 hour delay means that there's unknown exposure risk for people recreating on or in the water. We also have to go out to collect the sample, which costs both time and money. So similarly to making forecasts in meteorology, we can use dynamic mathematical models to make predictions about sewage pollution persistence. But we've all been duped by a forecast before and confidently walked outside without an umbrella in Cambridge only to realize it's raining sideways. So how do we make sure these models have the right information to make us prepared for sewage pollution discharges? Grounding models and experimental data is one such way to have greater confidence in model predictions. In my research, I conducted a series of experiments to determine what factors kill fecal bacteria in the water. The primary loss rate of these fecal bacteria is sunlight. They live happily in human guts where the sun doesn't shine and they die rapidly under sunlight exposure. Think about UV disinfection, which many of us became more familiar with during this quarantine. All loss rates were then used as parameters in a model to see how long the fecal bacteria persist in sewage pollution discharge at the surface. Here are three findings from this model. Number one, it shouldn't surprise you that bacteria die quickly, i.e. persist less in clear waters like Lake Tahoe, as opposed to dark waters like Hudson. Number two, you might be surprised though to hear that increased turbulence mixes bacteria deeper into the water column where there's less light and that makes them persist longer. So fecal bacteria in clear coastal ocean water in California will last longer than those discharged in Lake Tahoe. And number three, the time of day when a discharge happens matters. Discharges closer to sunrise have a full day of sunlight exposure so the bacteria die faster. Bacteria from sunset discharges instead persist longer. So overall, my research showed that fecal bacteria can persist between hours and days, and importantly, they can last much longer at discharges in darker, more turbulent water. Now, I didn't tell you this to deter you from going in or on the water. The majority of the time, it's fine. My goal is to make sure that you're safe whenever you're out there. So maybe in the near future, we will be able to tell you if that accidental mouthful of water you get while you're out jet skiing on the Hudson or the Charles River will make you sick. Thank you, Elise. I, yeah, I'm sort of sitting here um, trying to figure out how I keep my mouth really, really closed <laughs> <laughs> when I go anywhere near water. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sure. let's, let's go to our judges. Uh, any questions or comments from our judges? Hi, uh, great, great presentation. I, um, is your goal to develop a sensor that could um, be able to give a quick test? That's a great question. Um, so I've been working on a lot of different methods and one method is actually thinking about um, how can we tell from optical properties of the water whether or not we're having discharges of sewage. So um, one thing um, that's related to sewage discharges are kind of fluorescent um, chemicals that come from our personal care products. Um, so that's a pretty good indicator. So I've been doing some separate research on that as like another way to indicate. Um, but this research actually is gonna tie a little bit more into um, some work I've been doing with satellite data. Um, so understanding how important light has been for um, controlling these fecal bacteria populations. I'm mapping water transparency throughout the Hudson using satellite imagery um, and also measuring, taking measurements um, in the water. Um, and then we can create maps of like where it'll be, where fecal bacteria will persist longer. Um, so kind of giving like a hot spot, like maybe this area, you should wait four days before you go back in the water after discharge. Maybe this area, it's more or less fine a day or two later. I see. Thank you. Sure. Great question. Thank you. Um, a question from our audience here. Um, does the chemical composition of the water itself also have a long-term and adaptive impact on the quality, uh, on the, I'm sorry, on the quality of the water and the ability to address fecal matter? Um, sure, okay, I'm gonna, I wanna make sure that I understand this um, question correctly. So um, chemical components in the water, um, some of the things that I'm looking at are um, anthropogenic sourced. And so then they are something that um, does not naturally degrade. Sometimes they are things that don't naturally degrade um, within the system itself. So that may be something that would be of importance. Um, in the work that I've been doing so far, the chemical composition, um, like the ambient, environmental properties, if, that's, if the chemical composition means this. Um, so ambient properties like temperature, salinity, things like that, they have an effect, um, but like salinity doesn't have a whole lot of effect and temperature, um, just if you increase the temperature a bit, you actually have a faster decay of most of the bacteria. Um, so some of those then change how we're modeling. So then in the model, um, I can set the temperature, I can set the depth of the water column, how much mixing we have to try and get a better sense of how 
the actual physical and chemical properties of the water would affect that persistence of the bacteria. Great. Thank you so much. Um, just uh, everyone, um, this is just such important research and um, just so pleased to have everyone uh, here uh, and presenting. Um, our, our last presenter today is Toya Pujol Mitchell uh, from Purdue. We will now turn to you, Toya, to present your research. Um, okay, so is it, I just want to make sure it was showing properly. Yeah, okay, perfect. All right, so yes, thanks um, to uh, for this invite. This is really fun. Um, I've always wanted to do something like this, so excited to be doing this today, and um, I will uh, get started. <laughs> let me just, sorry, let me just make sure my PowerPoint's up so I can see it, and now my computer is being weird, so, okay. All right, so, um, my research is on health disparities, particularly around race, urbanicity, and gender. So research has proven that disparities between racial and ethnic groups can be driven by healthcare providers, lack of empathy for a patient, or even just a high level of distrust. A well-known example um, that many of us have probably heard of is what happened with Serena Williams, an elite athlete who is trained to know her body, had blood clots in her lungs after giving birth and was still sent home. And it was only after she was undergoing surgery and a large blood clot discovered in her abdomen that her complaints were believed. Disparities within um, urbanicity, on the other hand, can be driven by low healthcare access in rural areas. Often rural areas are underserved and persons may have to travel long distances for routine treatment for chronic health conditions such as hypertension. It was proposed uh, that telehealth could be a potential solution for this, but rural areas often don't have fast enough internet for video calls, an issue which President Biden is attempting to address with money for rural broadband in, spending, in his funding plan that he proposed last week. So- Excuse um, me, Toya. Yes. I, I apologize. I can't see your, your screen. I only see a, a, a blank screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my long intro, and then I'll start. <laughs> I'm gonna start okay. working <laughs> Uh, no worries, no worries. And also, by the way, it's very small. It's only about a third of the screen. Oh, the whole thing? Yeah. Oh, okay. That is weird. Okay. Let me make this bigger. Let's see if I do that. Nope. Because I'm looking okay. at it on that, YouTube that's a, too. That's a full screen. Thank you very that's much. Better. Okay. Better. Okay. Let me, how about, all right, let me do that. Okay. That work? Is that bigger? That's bigger. That okay. Bigger. Perfect. Thank you. Karen. All right. Oh, okay. So, um, Hopefully we'll see all this time think it's adjusted accordingly. So um, the way that I address these health disparities is through analysis of billing claims. And so what does that really mean? Um, when you go to the doctor, um, either because you're not feeling well or for a checkup, um, typically when you visit your clinician, you may have you know, some tests performed or you may be you know, admitted to the hospital or um, you may even get a prescription. But no matter, no matter what treatment you get when you go, a billing claim is generated and sent to your insurance company for reimbursement. Hence, you can imagine the billions of claims that are generated in a single year just in the US. And this is where the big data aspect of my research comes into play. So what is actually included in these claims? So in these, let me move this video so I can, okay. So what's included in these claims? So you can, and these claims will get service dates, such as when the visit actually occurred, a diagnosis during that visit, um, any procedure that was done during that visit, as well as uh, provider information, such as if it was in a hospital versus a um, private office, as um, provider information, such as the specialty of the specific provider, as well as patient information, such as your age, from your date of birth, gender, uh, race, et cetera. And so what I do, which is fascinating, and this challenging task is how do we take these claims that were generated for billing and then use them for this completely different purpose of identifying a study population or evaluating some health outcomes. And in order for me to, uh, to further determine and, uh, these disparities, I have to leverage other publicly available data sources that, enri that enrich my findings. So such as um, the National Provider Index, which gives us additional information about the provider so we can find differences in terms of treatment plans. 
looking at RUCC codes from the Department of Agriculture, which tells us if an enrollee is in an urban or a rural area. And then also census data, which gives us geographical social determinants, such as median income or access to healthy food that are other health determinants in the environment of the enrollee. So after this, we create, we developed these data procedures in order to identify the study population and these health outcomes. We can leverage statistics and machine learning and combine that with medical expertise so that we make sure that our work continues to be clinically relevant. And furthermore, we use causal inference so that we're not just making these assumptions between demographics um, at the association level, but we're actually able to develop new methods in the causal inference space so that we can find the causes of the, difference, the differences between uh, the health outcomes. So the ultimate goal of my research is of influencing healthcare policy to improve health for everyone, and then ultimately making your personal interactions with your clinician as equitable and productive as possible. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Toya. Um, judges, questions or comments from any one of you? Oh, great presentation. Uh, I have one question. How does difference in insurance coverage how does that factor into your analysis? So normally um, with claims data, you'll actually have either, let me stop sharing, you'll actually have um, private insurance um, or in a certain database, or you'll have public insurance where you'll have a Medicaid database. And um, normally when you're actually doing analysis, you'll look at one population or the other because the populations aren't necessarily, um, necessarily homogeneous. But what you can do is, um, well, one of the things I wanna do is that you do look at this private insurance and you do look at the same health outcomes in this public insurance and then compare differences. because so that's another aspect of an equity that we can definitely um, assess as well. Great, um, any other questions from, our, from any of our judges? Okay, looks like we have an audience question here. Are you also looking at historical patterns of health disparities by communities, districts, regions, or other types of geographic uh, distinctions and correlating with resources available to treat? So um, when you're using claims data, um, it is difficult to do assessment at like a treatment level, such as um, figuring out like a clinical trial or figuring out a specific uh, data pattern or a specific treatment pattern that can um, have outcomes. Um, it's really good for this aggregated population health uh, assessment and differences. And it's also really helpful because the data is so large, it's really helpful for assessment of rare, uh, rare outcomes like suicide, for example. You can, so um, to answer the question in terms of looking at differences in geography, we do that all the time. We'll look at what is happening in one state versus another state, especially when you're looking at um, public insurance that is actually driven by what, um, what the specific state chooses to cover in their Medicare, Medicaid services that can result in major differences. Um, I do health, um, I do a lot of work in women's health. And so for example, with ACA, you can see differences, you know, if contraception is covered or not, how that drastically impacts teen pregnancy and um, stuff like that. So um, we look at geographic differences that way and um, you'll see actually the uh, policies um, in the data. Hopefully that answers the question. I don't know if that was specific enough. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Well, um, we, we've heard again, some wonderful research, Danielle, Keith, Sam, Rod, Andy, Elise and Toya, thank you all so very much. Uh, you've, you've all done just wonderful job in, in your presentations. So while our judges deliberate um, and before they um, are, able to, to announce the winners. Um, we're, we're gonna do an audience choice award here. Um, we'd like you um, as the audience participants to weigh in on a crowd favorite. Um, the judges are following really strict criteria um, on science communications to make their decisions. Um, but this winning competitor will also be un filtered audience choice award um, to which we invite all of our crowd to apply their favorite 
filters um, be on the topic presented or the type of presentation that's been made here. Um, so we're going to make a live poll so that everyone has some time to vote. I'm waiting for our judges to return. They've got a couple of minutes, but I can announce that Elise, you were the audience favorite in terms of your presentation. So I don't know what the judge well, is going to come up with, um, but the so audience much, um, uh, felt that uh, you, you did a good job in, in, in presenting um, this afternoon. Uh, so congratulations to you from, from that perspective. While the judges are getting are returning, beginning to return, I, I just wanted to say that uh, thank you everyone, first of all, for participating. And, and I hope that you will dream my dream and share my vision that what this can become. Uh, this is a wonderful first start for BAMIT in doing a research slam. And, and hopefully going forward, this can become a regular program for BAMIT, an opportunity to highlight and showcase the research talents of our community. Um, you are inspirational. Please hang in there. Uh, as a fellow PhD, I, I have been there. It can sometimes be a very lonely road. So uh, you have a whole community that is encouraging you and praying for you and, and supporting what you're doing. Um, many of us who, who have doctorates today didn't have hardly anyone that looked like us to look ahead and encourage us. I met one black woman PhD during my undergrad at MIT. So hopefully in the future, not only are we showcasing black graduate students and their research, but perhaps it, there'll be a point where we can add undergrads who are, you can showcase their Europe or perhaps showcase their senior thesis from MIT. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and eventually as Holly indicated, this can become something that is showcased to juniors and seniors in high school to get them thinking not only about, or, or even younger students, maybe even starting in middle school, not only thinking about going into STEM, but that they're gonna go to, to undergrad and eventually do some type of graduate study that prepares them either for academia or running their own company with their great invention. Mm -hmm. I also want to point out to you that the judges for this event were selected particularly for, for, for some key reasons. You know, Kendra is a reporter on technology and science uh, so that you want to make sure that you are communicating your ideas effectively. Uh, Valencia, Dr. Valencia Kumsen, uh, is a professor at, at Tufts and a visiting professor at MIT this year in electrical engineering. And Aiden, who's a really good friend here, I'm in Austin with him also, he's an attorney for intellectual property. We want to remind you that it is important for you to make sure that your great ideas are receiving the protection uh, of patents mm -hmm. and, and or trade secret and that you are being careful in, in, in making sure that you're protecting your future opportunities uh, with, with all the great things that you're doing. So there was a reason behind why each one of them was selected and invited to participate here, uh, here today. Thank you for participating. I believe all of our judges are now back in the room and it's time to give out some prizes. Prize, yeah. Holly? Um, we will start with third place. Um, and I'm not sure which of the judges is uh, presenting what, but each of our judges will uh, announce uh, a winner. So third place winner. Yes, um, with Aiden, is he here? Aiden was going to announce the third place winner. Yeah, I don't see, is, is yeah. Aiden back? just resent him the link. This is always a, a, a struggle for us going from one room to the other, but should be here. Okay. I think he's in as an attendee and not. I see. Oh, okay. Stand by. Okay. We'll, we'll get him in here. Suspense. <laughs> Every competition needs a little suspense. <laughs> uh. 
while we're doing while we're doing that um i think that um you know uh, Candria, I, I i just want to bookmark um one of the things that you that, that you said um you know, a, a lot of my work has been in higher ed. Uh, here's here's a sorry about that. I, I clicked on the wrong link. Uh -huh. I don't know if you guys are already gone. And, no, and no, no, no. We're 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 okay. still here. But I'll, I'll I'll just finish my point. Uh, 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 and one of the things that we've talked about is pipeline, um, and pipeline as it relates to um, you know professorial ranks in higher ed and and uh, in STEM particularly and. Uh, for me, this is one of the reasons that this is so important and why I am just so um, touched and invigorated seeing um, each of you as you pursue your doctoral work, uh, through your work in higher education, because this is so critically important. Um, and I hope um, a number of you will consider um, returning to higher ed um, as you do this work, uh, because we need to have um, representations in the professorial ranks and you know when I look at Valencia um, and, and I see the work that you're doing uh, I, I'm, I'm just so so pleased uh, that, thank you. that you're doing the work that you're doing and Angie as well so so thank you okay I think we're ready to announce and Aiden okay we had the third place winner here right. thank you um and, and, and first of all I want I think that all the judges, and I'll speak for myself, and I'm sure they, they, they could chime in when they introduce the winners for the other um, two slots, but um, I, I will say the presentations are all very great. Um, you know, I think uh, Kandre um, chose, uh, Kay chose us um, partly because, you know, two of us are people who have to take the technology and be able to communicate it with lay people. As a lawyer, that's usually what I have to do. Um, and be able to do that. And so really, you know, if you look at sort of the criteria is about how the communication and not necessarily was about the research. And so um, with that in mind, I, I wanna just, uh, you know, that's how we, we looked at the judging and, and really think, uh, thought about it. And it really wasn't how to do anything at all with the research. I think all the research was great, but it really was focused on um, just the way it was communicated and how effectively that was and, and your slides and things like that. So um, with, um, with that said, I, the third place is going to go to uh, Angie um, with the um, Smart City. And uh, congratulations, Angie. Um, I, I say I really liked, I think you came out of the gate with, um, it, you really expressed why this was needed, you know, with growing population, um, you know, in smart cities, and you explain exactly why what you're working on is actually solving a global problem, and you sort of kept it from from there, and uh, and, and that's really what stood out at least to me, and um, and so so that and when we're looking at how you communicate, how you catch the um, listeners' attention. Uh, that was that was really was important in, in what we saw um, in in what you presented. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you, Aiden, and congratulations, Angie. Okay. Thank you. Um, second place. It's not me, but I'm, <laughs> I'm telling the second place is um, Elise Myers. Um, and the judges felt that you were just very clear from the beginning. You're very clear in the context. You're clear on the problem. You're um, just, you didn't delve into too much jargon. It was just very clear sort of what the problem with the solution was. You made it relevant to the audience by like comparing it to Cambridge and weather. Um, some of the things that we felt um, maybe um, was a little bit more sort of like what the goal was could have been better articulated, like what the final product was and also sort of a little bit more technical information, but br broadly it was just very clearly communicated and it was really great. So thank you. Thank you, Kendra, and congratulations, Elise. Okay, now, first place. Okay, drum roll. Drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> so our first place winner is uh, Rod Bayless, the third, um, and, and, and the judges commented on um, you, also your great presentation skills and the way in which you articulated the significance of your research and presenting 
some technical detail, but a right good balance that that would be um, could be hold the attention of the, of the audience. So really great presentation and well done to all of you, all of, to all the presenters. And thank you and congratulations, Rod. Oh, congratulations to everyone. Um, thank you, judges. Uh, you, you, you had a monumental task ahead of you because all of these presentations were, were, were so well done. Um, and, um, you know, this is also an important process because one of the things that we wanted to do with this research, research slam was um, also look at this from a mentoring perspective. How, how, to, how, how do um, professionals in the field um, help and assist and provide comment um, and questions. So hopefully um, those of you who presented as researchers um, have benefited and can continue to benefit from this process as well. And um, feel free to reach out uh, to um, each of these because um, Communication is an important aspect of, of what you do. And as Ken, uh, Keandria said, um, you, you've got some um, wonderful assets here in, in helping you fine tune as you go about your work. So great job um, to everyone. And again, um, thank you judges. Uh, thank you so much presenters. Uh, you do all of us proud um, in the work that you're doing. Uh, thank you to Patrick and, and, and uh, your team as well, and to um, Moana and Joe, and uh, who, who else is here? Paige and our um, uh, alumni association team who just do so much in terms of um, helping us put on um, these kinds of initiatives and events. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.